So this molecule is nermotrelvir. It's one of the main components of Paxlovid, which was developed remarkably quickly for the treatment of COVID-19 by a team of scientists at Pfizer. Now, I should say up front, I don't work for a pharmaceutical company of any sort. I'm making this video purely for educational reasons. I want to have a think about how you might make this using reasonably simple ideas, but not necessarily using chemistry that works well on an industrial scale. Doing a retrosynthetic analysis will quickly identify two key disconnections to break this molecule up. There are two amide bonds just highlighted here and here. And so we can quite quickly break this down into three smaller units, just highlighted with different colors here each of which are quite closely related to amino acid structures, but not the conventional ones straight away. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to refer to the orange one as fragment A, the green one as fragment B, and the purple one as fragment C. Now this goes some way to explain how the synthesis of this molecule was done so quickly, is that we can focus on making these three small components separately and then join them together at the end. Structures quite similar to these had already formed part of previous pharmaceutical products and ways you might go about synthesizing things like this had already been experimented on. In fact, there's a really great paper that's been published by the Pfizer team explaining some of their journey towards this drug target under accelerated time pressure, and I've linked it in the description below. There's also some excellent commentary by Derek Lowe on the In The Pipeline blog. I'll also put a link to that in the description. Now, if we're trying to make these amide bonds, well, there are lots of ways you might think about doing that, but the most reliable way will use a coupling agent. Now, of course, there are lots of ways of making amides, and often the default is just to use an acid chloride. And that's all well and good in simple circumstances. We could draw a reasonably traditional mechanism looking something like this, which would give us this intermediate, which then after the loss of a proton allows us to expel the chloride as a leaving group and generate our amide bond. And we can just make sure there's a weak base in there to mop up that HCl and push the reaction forwards. Commonly, the base that's used in such things is pyridine, and there's a variety of reasons why this one can be useful, but certainly one of them is that this can act as a nucleophilic catalyst. That means that the pyridine can also attack into the acid chloride and directly kick out the leaving group, giving us a more electrophilic intermediate that looks like this, this pyridinium species. If you're doing this in the lab, you'd often have the acid chloride and the pyridine pre-mixing anyway, and you'll see the formation of this happening by the formation of a yellow solution, like a really bright yellow one. This intermediate is more reactive than the acid chloride itself, and it just gives a mechanism with a lower activation barrier than we had before to get to the same products. And that probably just makes your life a bit easier in the lab. So both of these routes go to the same product, so it doesn't matter if both of them are happening at the same time, but it does highlight where the technical problem is with more complex molecules in that we do have to keep an eye on other mechanisms that are available under our conditions. I'm not saying that this is the easier pathway, but it's certainly one that's available and does have some consequences. Under basic conditions, it's also possible for acid chlorides to eliminate HCl in a mechanism something like this. This E2 type elimination can occur when the hydrogen and the chloride are antiperiplanar, and it's possible to form this ketene intermediate. Now, at first glance, we might wonder why we're even bothered about this, because this is a very electrophilic species. It can react with the amine anyway, like this. After a loss of a proton, we'll get this enolate which can, of course, just reprotonate on the alpha carbon and generate our target amide anyway. But there's a key problem about this route in the step using the enolate. That enolate could pick up that proton from either side of the molecule, from the top or the bottom face. So if your starting material had an alpha stereocenter on the acid chloride, the stereochemistry would be scrambled by the end of this process. Depending on the circumstances, might be 50-50, might not. But in any case, this potential for epimerization could really screw over other steps you've put lots of effort into. We're going to need a solution to this. Even if we only go down that route for a little bit of a time, it will still destroy the configurational purity of that stereocenter. In the case of nermotrelvir, that means we'll generate a diastereomer, as in a compound with completely different properties. Making mixtures like this is really bad news in the pharmaceutical industry, not least because it's destroying the yield of what we want. We might be generating a compound that was just something really bad to people when it's put into the body. And even from a regulation point of view, you'd need to isolate any other stereoisomers and check for that as part of the registration process. And just purely on a financial grounds, that's going to start getting expensive to check. So how do we get around this? Well, the general idea 
It's just to get around the fact that the acid chloride is too prone to elimination. So we'll start with the carboxylic acid and rather than convert it into the acid chloride and then use that, we'll activate it in such a way that I'm just going to represent with this green blob to make all of this a leaving group. And then we can just add our amine to this activated species instead to get our amide product. Now, if we look back on the Nermatrelvir structure itself and our components A, B and C, we can certainly see in A and B that they have an alpha stereocenter next to their carboxylic acid. So any route involving an acid chloride risks scrambling those stereocenters. So we're going to have to use this route using coupling agents in our synthesis. I figure there are three major players in this space. As this type of reaction has been known for quite a while, one of the earliest reagents used here is called DCC. That's dicyclohexyl carbodiimide. It has a structure that looks like this. Now, this isn't the nicest compound in the world. In fact, I'd advise a lot of caution if you ever find yourself using it in a lab. You can become allergic to this just from touch exposure, which might mean you will come out in quite a heavy rash anytime anyone else is using it nearby you in the future. You so-called can become sensitized to this one. Not ideal. So it's just here for historical reasons, really. It's a sort of flaky powder to use. So it's reasonably easy to handle if you're using your standard protective equipment. If I react this one with our carboxylic acid, we can notice that it's got some lone pairs on those nitrogens, which are basic. So an equilibrium gets set up with the weak acid starting material, where we've now made a more nucleophilic and a more electrophilic species at the same time. The protonated DCC is electrophilic at this carbon in the middle, kind of like quite an unhindered aminium ion. Once we've got this intermediate, the amine can attack initially to give this intermediate, but after a proton transfer, we can get to this one, where we now can kick out this leaving group. That gives us our amide that we want and this urea byproduct. Now the formation of this heavily conjugated carbonyl is going to be an enthalpic driving force for this reaction. This byproduct is super stable and is doing the thermodynamic heavy lifting for this process. If you try and do this in the lab, however, depending on which amide you're trying to make, this urea can be notorious. It can be really streaky on a chromatography column and might really mess around with your purification processes if you're unlucky. And this was acknowledged to be a big problem, of course, and led to the development of a slightly modified reagent called EDC, or sometimes called EDCI. Now I'm going to give up on the long form names of these because they're going to get quite complicated, but it has a very similar structure in that it has this diimide component in the middle, except it has different side chains. Now there's been some modifications to this one, which are sort of twofold. One of the main benefits comes in purification because it turns out that the urea byproduct of this one can be washed away using a separating funnel in mild acid because of course you can still protonate on here. So with working up with mild acid, this will wash away into the aqueous layer. So that's a massive advantage for this particular reagent. One other benefit in fact comes in the mechanism in that when you react it with a carboxylic acid like we did before, it can sort of self-activate as well ready for the carboxylate to attack. Now these two reagents have been on the scene for quite a number of years, and there have been some further optimizations. Although going through these routes tends to avoid going through the ketene by elimination of this proton, the thing we're trying to avoid if our molecule has stereocenters in it, it's not absolutely perfect. And it was found empirically that you could suppress that reaction pathway even further if you also have in there some hydroxybenzotriazole, which looks like this often abbreviated to HOBT. And that interrupts the original sequence of steps and adds yet another intermediate like this one. And it's been observed that this species is no longer prone to elimination. As in, if we do have a stereocenter next to the carbonyl group, it's very unlikely that the configuration will get altered at any point during the reaction if we have the hydroxybenzotriazole present. And the reaction sequence continues as intended with the nucleophilic attack of the amine to give us our amide product. Now this is all getting a little bit fiddly, and as time progressed, chemists worked out a better way of doing this. In fact, a reagent was developed that is very much more common nowadays for these types of reactions. And that's called HATU. And this optimized reagent that, that combines all of these factors together has a slightly complicated structure and an even more complicated name. Google it if you want to. It's an organic salt with an organic cation and PF6 minus counter ion. We can see some of the inspiration from this from the previous discussion. Up the top is a pre-activated electrophile, an aminium in fact, just like when we were using EDC. The slightly more complicated looking triazole structure is clearly based on HOBT as before. 
one new addition though, which is thought to be quite important, is the addition of this pyridine nitrogen. So the idea is we could just use this HATU coupling agent in the same way as DCC and EDC. We react it in the first instance with the carboxylic acid to put an activating group on it so that we can push towards a urea byproduct as before. We also generate the hydroxy triazole type intermediate, which gives us an intermediate which is stable to E2 elimination, which is thought to go via this tetrahedral intermediate that can be even further stabilized by a hydrogen bond to the pyridine like nitrogen. Then a final arrow plus some proton transfers will get us to the amide that we were aiming for. So nowadays you'll see these reactions just using HATU with the parent carboxylic acid and, and amine to form the amide. In fact, it was used in the industry synthesis by Pfizer for Nermatrelvir in real life. Epimerization of a starting material carboxylic acid isn't usually found to be a problem with this reagent, which is nice. If you're enjoying the video so far, please do like, share and subscribe. It really does help my videos reach more people who are learning chemistry at all different stages, which is my main aim for making the videos. Right then, so now we have an idea of how we might do some of the coupling steps. Let's have a look at how we might make some of these fragments. One thing we're going to have to keep a real eye on is these alpha stereocenters on fragments A and B. For fragment A, just as a retrosynthesis idea, we can see that it's actually got another amide inside, which gives us an indication of what our starting material should be. We don't have to do very much at all, actually, because this molecule is commercially available. This is called tert leucine. It's the L enantiomer. It's a structural isomer of leucine. This was recognized like 100 years ago of being something very useful, and so is made industrially and available in our chiral pool. But as with most amino acids, you can buy them in a protected form, and that'll be useful for us for some practical reasons, but also keeping an eye to chemoselectivity issues in the forward synthesis. It's possible to buy this as the Bok protected species, the Bok group just being a carbamate. Now this molecule isn't massively cheap, but it's not massively expensive either. At time of recording from a standard chemical supplier, you can buy this for 175 US dollars for 25 grams. 25 grams is 0.11 mole. And so we're going to use that as our starting material for fragment A. We're going to have to tweak some bits later, but they'll more naturally come up later. Next to turn to fragment B, but I'm going to keep fragment C on the screen just for a moment. Although it might not look like it now, there are some similarities in how we might retrosynthesize these two. So the thing that's staring out massively for me on B is the cyclopropane, and that's going to have to be the key focus of this retrosynthesis. One very popular way of disconnecting cyclopropanes is to the alkene, so maybe to something like this. And all of a sudden, this is looking very like a natural amino acid. If that double bond had two more hydrogens across it, it would be L-proline. So that looks like it might be what our starting material should be. But we have to think carefully about how we might get that cyclopropane on this. Now, there are some slightly niche ways of doing this using transition metal catalysis. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to stick to some quite classical synthesis ideas. But before we go there, we should have a think about how you might even make this if we're going to propose this as an intermediate. One way we might make a double bond would be by elimination. Maybe we could lose water from this molecule. Now, this molecule is hydroxyproline, and this particular isomer is really readily available. It can be extracted directly from collagen, which is all over the natural world. But unfortunately, we're likely to run into a problem here. Even if we make the hydroxyl group into a leaving group, like a tosylate, it's much more likely that we'll eliminate in the wrong position and put the double bond in this position here. That's because the E2 transition state for that elimination will just be lower in energy because it can conjugate with the nitrogen lone pairs. So when there's a choice between the two protons that could eliminate, it'll go for the one that we don't want and form the enamine instead. So this route doesn't look like a goer. Okay, so what else could we do? Well, maybe we could do a functional group into conversion. And what I'm going to do here is introduce a carbonyl group. Now, what we've actually done here is we've made an amide. And at some point going forwards, we should be able to reduce that to the amine using pretty standard chemistry. We should be able to use some sort of hydride reducing agent to do this. But of course, if we are going to use a hydride reducing agent, we'd have to watch out for the fact that there's an electrophilic beta center. So we might want to change the order of steps to prevent the hydride adding in a 1,4 or a Michael type addition. Another slightly dangerous thing about this particular intermediate is now this proton here. 
This proton's become very acidic. If we removed it, it would go to a pyrrole ring structure. So that's a super stable conjugate base. So this intermediate isn't going to be very useful for us in a synthesis. So I definitely have to make an adjustment to my plan. So rather than taking the cyclopropane off first, the first disconnection becomes the functional group interconversion, and we start to avoid those chemoselectivity issues. I can't disconnect the cyclopropane, otherwise I get to the same intermediate. But to help me get around some of this, we could change the carboxylic acid functional group as well. Now I should just be able to oxidize to go backwards, but we should bear in mind it's not normally a great idea to carry a three hydroxyl group around. We might need to use a protecting group or something. But before worrying about that, we should just have a think about how we might even make the cyclopropane. And what I have in mind for this is a phosphorus-based reagent. Quite an old school transformation here, but this illid is reasonably easy to make. These readily do conjugate addition on alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl groups to give us a species that looks like this. The enolate can then do an intramolecular displacement of the phosphine leaving group to give us the gem dimethyl cyclopropane. And it looks like we should be able to use this chemistry in our synthesis. The thing we need to keep an eye on is that it needs to go on the back face. Now that dangling alcohol might be able to block the front face of the molecule a little bit relative to the back face of the ring, but I'm not massively convinced. I don't think we'd get good diastereoselectivity if we tried that. So bearing in mind, we might need a protecting group anyway. We can kill two birds with one stone and tie the molecule together. Perhaps we could join up this oxygen and the nitrogen and form a bicycle. Those are normally really useful in diastereoselective syntheses. So there's a couple of common options we could take here. We could just make the acetonide. That's just tying together those groups with acetone. Or we could make this other type of aminal using benzaldehyde. Either of these would probably work fine in this case. The point is that these molecules have a convex and a concave face which is a severe steric differentiation, which will allow us to get the cyclopropane on correctly. And I just need to make some space to make that more clear. Now I'm going to choose the one that has the phenyl group on here, because I think that will give me the most curled up molecule. If I have two methyl groups on that center, that might mess around with there being one specific low energy conformation. Whereas if I have a hydrogen on there, at least there's something small to go into sterically bad places. To do the cyclopropanation, I'd need the alkene in this position. Just as a reminder, to go back, we need this illid. So I guess if we have a think about the shape of this molecule, just as a quick sketch, we're looking at something like this, where it's kind of curled over to make the concave face at the top and the convex face sort of on the outside. So in theory, it should be easier for nucleophiles to attack from the bottom face here. And that will actually give us the diastereoma that we want in our retrosynthesis. Okay, plowing on forwards, we can do another functional group into conversion. Here, all we need to do is some sort of oxidation. That's just getting the alpha, beta and saturated carbonyl group in. So there's a few classical ways we could do this. We could go really old school and go via the enolate Add a selenium into the alpha position, oxidize the selenium, several ways of doing that. We could use MCPVA or hydrogen peroxide or something. And if you heated this selenoxide, it would eliminate to give us the alpha, beta and saturated carbonyl. That's a pericyclic process. That's just taking that proton and orange and whizzing the arrows around in the ring. Another possibility would be to use a Sagusa oxidation. This is where we would make a enol ether treat it with palladium acetate, then wait for a beta hydride elimination to give us the same product. Although admittedly, that might not be a great reaction to be doing on a significant scale. Anyhow, getting sidetracked, back to the retrosynthesis in green. I'm going to take off my aminal because at this stage, I recognize I'm, that I'm very close to another chiral pool starting material. In the forward synthesis, I could just make that aminal using benzaldehyde and catalytic acid using the standard mechanism for forming anything that looks like an acetal. In that mechanism, the phenyl group will be able to point itself on the outside onto the convex face because the mechanism is all reversible. So all I'm going to do is form the thermodynamic diastereomer, which I think is the one I've drawn. This alcohol is just one step away from a readily available starting material, this carboxylic acid here. We should be able to reduce that carboxylic acid in the presence of an amide using BH3. But the acid here itself is commercially available. 
This is pyroglutamic acid. In fact, it's the L enantiomer, which is really good for us on the cost grounds. And the reason why it's really cheap is that you can just get this directly by heating up the natural amino acids. You're talking temperatures above like 100 degrees C, but easy enough to do. In fact, it's such a common starting material that you can just buy the pyroglutamic acid directly. At the time of recording, this is 182 US dollars for 500 grams from a common chemical supplier. Then just for reference, that's 3.9 moles. So getting quite a lot for your money there. Okay, just taking stock. At the moment, we've got fragments A and B. And now we should have a look at fragment C as well. Now I'm going to stay on the same slide here in thinking about that molecule. I'm just going to declutter a bit. Just focusing in on this molecule in the middle here, in the middle of our synthesis, it's actually not a million miles away if we highlight it in a specific way. What I'm going to do is just focus in on the carbonyl compound here and just highlight these carbons, numbering them one, two, three, four, five. Fragment C up in the top corner has a similar type structure if we look at these carbons here where I'm numbering them one, two, three, four, and five. We can see that there's a stereocenter on carbon four, which bears a nitrogen. It's just the ring structures are slightly different. One thing we do need to do is do some substitution at position two. Now, just in my retrosynthetic planning, I'm, I'm just gonna think about building up the carbon skeleton first. If we did the substitution at position two, perhaps we could do something like this. We could make an enolate taking a proton at position two, and then we could do some sort of alkylation chemistry. Maybe, for example, use this bromoacetonitrile, which should give us an SN2 reaction on the back face, so that's the convex face again, to give us this intermediate in blue. If we hydrogenate that nitrile, we will have added the two more carbons that we need for our fragment C, and then treating this with a bit of acid and water, we might hope to be able to rearrange this in the first instance getting rid of the acetal, but we also might be able to transamidate this along these sorts of lines to change the ring around. Although the observant among you will have noticed there's a problem with trying to use this route in that we've got the incorrect stereochemistry at center two. So this is pretty sad. If we try to use a common intermediate to make both pieces B and C, we'll end up with the wrong diastereomer for C. So we'll have to find a completely new route. Now we can use the same sort of alkylation chemistry though. And in fact, what I'm going to describe is very closely related to the actual Pfizer synthesis. We can identify in this intermediate C that the nitrile is the same oxidation level as an acid, an ester, or an amide. We can see that there's an alpha amino stereocenter. And bearing that in mind, this structure is actually very close to glutamic acid. If we cut across here and here, we just need to add those two extra carbons and the nitrogen if we cut across there, we're going to have to deal with a new stereocenter as well. And it turns out there's a quite straightforward application of enolate chemistry to use the alpha amino stereocenter to direct one three the other stereocenter. I think this is best explained looking at the forward synthesis. This is the key starting material used, L-dimethyl glutamate. So that's just the natural amino acid with the nitrogen protected with a Bok group, as is standardly the case for commercial amino acids. But here, both of the carboxylic acids are hidden as methyl esters as well. At the time of recording, this is 204 US dollars for 50 grams, and that's 0.24 moles. What we need to do to this is to use some dianion chemistry developed by Hanessian. I'll leave a link to the reference in the description. We can use lithium HMDS. This is just a bigger brother of LDA, a super bulky base, which normally deprotonates via open type transition states. But in here, we're finding our two most acidic protons, which are this one on the nitrogen, and presumably the next most acidic one is the one here. This should form the Z enolate like this, and also deprotonate on the nitrogen. So this dianion won't be isolated, but it'll be most nucleophilic at the position that was harder to deprotonate, which is the enolate position I've just pointed out with the arrow. Now it looks like that should alkylate on either the front or the back face as we appear to have an open chain molecule. But this reaction is in fact highly diastereoselective. Having a think about why, well, you've got the dianion and some lithium in there. 
there's every possibility that this molecule would like to sit round chelated up together with lithium shared between the anionic sites. If it did so, there would be a seven-membered ring. There may be other possible confirmations. This is just a suggestion from me about how we might explain the selectivity. I haven't got any proof apart from the doodle that I'm going to draw. If we have a seven-membered ring like that, how we might work out the lowest energy confirmation, well, we can have a think about what a seven-membered ring would look like, and maybe it would look a bit like a chair, but then it's got a bit too much. So maybe something like this sort of shape seems vaguely plausible. What I'll notice is down on the right-hand side, that would be quite a good place to accommodate a CC double bond with some sp2 centers as it's essentially flat there. Getting the rest of this in, we're going to put a lithium in to collate everything up. The nitrogen will be on the far left with a bot group on it. And then I'll propose that this is the lowest energy confirmation because this will put the bigger ester group in a pseudo equatorial position. And so what I'm asserting here is the enolate might be sitting in a confirmation like this. If we then treat this with an alkylating agent, we can use the same one as we did before, this bromoacetonitrile. There's two positions we could attack. The enolates would probably want to attack in the direction I'm indicating with the green arrow there, as there's kind of loads of space there. It's kind of open. It's a flat end of the molecule. There's nothing really in its way. Whereas if we consider the alternative, there's a lot more stuff potentially that can block attack onto the electrophile in that direction, highlighted with a red dotted arrow. Now, just taking care of the stereochemistry, I'll just number in the atoms again. I've got one, two, where we're going to alkylate, three, four, five. And in our product as well, we can see atoms one, two, three, four, five. The alkylation will come on as the front as drawn, and the hydrogen will be behind, which is the exact stereochemistry we require at position two. And then we're good to go. I can take this intermediate and hydrogenate the nitrile using a rainy nickel catalyst and hydrogen gas, which will reduce down to the amine. But that amine won't be stable as it is because it can easily cyclize. It's with a couple of proton transfers there to give me the cyclic amide, the lactam. So then actually we're really close to a useful fragment First, what we can do is treat this with just some acid. This is to remove the BOP group, then just treat it with ammonia to convert the remaining ester to an amide. So after those two steps, we'll be left with this fragment, and we're going to use this as a surrogate for C. It's not quite there. In fact, if we look at the structure at the top, what we needed was a nitrile in this position, not an amide. But nitriles are a little bit more electrophilic than amides. So it might not be wise to keep it hanging around in multiple steps. So although we could make it right now, the Pfizer synthesis actually installs that nitrile right at the very end. So this amide can almost be seen as a protecting group for the nitrile. And to finally bring all of this together, I've got the different pieces on the screen here representing the different components that we're going to use for the synthesis. What I'm going to do here is just talk through the OG synthesis published by Pfizer. It's been optimized since, but it does give the overall idea of what's going on. We're first going to need to manipulate this green intermediate. Firstly, we can reduce the amide to the amine using lithium aluminium hydride. And two, I can just use some acid and water to cleave the aminal, just using standard mechanisms there. Next, I need to oxidize up that alcohol. I mean, there are lots of ways we might think about doing this. A classic textbook way might be to use a Jones oxidation, but there are also lots of other ways we could oxidize via the aldehyde and then use a pinnic oxidation, amongst others. You wouldn't be wanting to use the chromate on an industrial scale, but this is just a paper exercise at this point. Now, I don't want to be keeping that acid hanging around. I can just quickly turn that into the ester just the methyl ester while we do the amide coupling reactions. And then I think we're good to go. Next, I need to bring in the orange intermediate, the one based on tert leucine. And we can just do a coupling reaction with this using HATU with a mild inoffensive amine base, just helping out there. 
This will perform our first coupling step to give us this product. Next thing that the team did was to juggle some of the protecting groups. So first I can just hydrolyze the methyl ester with lithium hydroxide and then cleave off the bot group in acid. That will give me the free amine and the acid like this. Now the amine at the bottom is the most nucleophilic position and I need to trifluoroacylate this. So using a reagent such as this, again with a mild base kicking around, should work well. That's this type of mechanism with a proton transfer inside it to give me this new trifluoroacyl intermediate. And then we're very close now. We just need to focus in on this carboxylic acid and do the second coupling reaction. So I need the purple intermediate now. And in fact, they did this coupling using EDC instead of HATU. There's pros and cons associated with that. And now we're really close to our target product. All we need to deal with is turning this primary amide into a nitrile. So in fact, what we need to do is to dehydrate here. Just as a quick aside, the common reagent for doing this is POCl3 or cyanuric chloride. Both of these do the same sort of thing mechanism wise, which is something like this, where the oxygen of the amide is more nucleophilic, particularly if it can form a strong phosphorus oxygen bond. And then we can eliminate to the triple bond. Now, I guess for some reason, industrially, these weren't so good. For reference, I'm not so worried about them reacting with the secondary amides. We should just be able to hydrolyze it back. So there should be a window of reactivity for the primary amide over those. It turns out this transformation worked best in the presence of Burgess reagent, which is a slightly more obscure dehydrating agent. I'll just put the structure in. You often see this one dehydrating aldol products in complex total synthesis, but I guess it works here too via some sort of similar mechanism. Again, taking our primary amide and this time attacking the sulfur instead to kick out the leaving group should give us something that looks like this. And I guess you can just eliminate this off. Might not be exactly like this, but just for tidiness, I could use that nitrogen negative charge to push around like this. And that'll give us our nitrile. And after all of that, we have our final product. For those interested in the biology of this things, it turns out that nitrile group is super important for the bioactivity of this molecule. Nermatrelvia is an example of a covalent inhibitor, and that's known to interact with a cysteine residue on a relevant protein connected to the COVID-19 virus. And so the mode of action for this antiviral will involve a sulfur lone pair nucleophilically attacking onto that nitrile the rest of the molecule, presumably organizing it in a way to put these two groups right next to each other to promote this interaction. If you've enjoyed this video, there's a few others from my channel on different types of syntheses. The YouTube algorithm is suggesting that these ones might be good for you.